Okay, Community Matters, I'm Jay Fidel, and we're going to talk about chicken and egg, legal chicken, legal egg, national burning issues, which is a program that is going to take place on September 30th at 10 a.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. And if you want to register, go to our website, thinktechhawaii.com, and you can register right there. One of the speakers is here with us today, uh, Chris Marvin. Chris Marvin is going to cover the area of gun violence prevention. Welcome to the show, Chris. Glad to be here, Jay. Thanks for having me. Let's play, uh, let's play our little promo uh, so we can get the flavor of this and let people know, you know, the, the, the four corners of this program. We'll play it now. In transitional times, every action has a reaction. This cycle gives us an echo chamber. New events lead to legal changes, of course, and legal changes lead to new events. Yes, it is chicken and egg. And these days, could it be that the interaction time is faster than before? Your host for this conversation is Avi Soifer, professor and former dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Panelist Kimi Ide Foster is a partner in the law firm of Chun Kerr in Honolulu, Hawaii. In this program, she will discuss abortion in America. Panelist Chris Marvin is a former military helicopter pilot and principal of Marvin Strategies, a strategic communications firm specializing in cultural advocacy through socially minded narrative building. In this program, he will discuss gun violence prevention. Panelist Richard Walsgrove is an assistant professor of law and co-director of the Environmental Law Program at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. In this program, he will discuss the challenges of climate change. Panelist Sylvia Albert is the director of voting and elections at Common Cause in Washington, D.C. In this program, she will cover voting rights in America. Panelist Jeff Portnoy is a partner in Cage Shadi, a law firm in Honolulu, Hawaii. In this program, he will cover insurrection and beyond. Come join us for this important discussion. You can register to attend on thinktechhawaii.com. Please do, and we'll see you there. Aloha. Well, Chris, it's uh, so nice to talk to you today. I, I, I'd like to ask you a little about yourself. Hel helicopter pilot, how does that inform your discussion of gun violence prevention? Yeah, well, so I was, a, I was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. I was actually with the 25th Infantry Division. Uh, I'm an Afghanistan veteran, was wounded in Afghanistan. Um, I actually come from a long line of military service. Um, my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather are all Army combat veterans. And uh, my sixth great-grandfather actually served in the Revolutionary War, um, 1776, New York militia. So, um, so you know, I, I, I have a, a you know, strong military family history. Um, but what I really believe is that anybody who served in the military uh, has a, a, a valid, credible, strong opinion on uh, gun safety, um, because we were trained by taxpayer dollars to, to, to learn about weapons uh, and, and specifically learn about gun, gun safety and accountability. Um, one of the things we talk about often when we're engaging veterans in the gun violence prevention conversation is that the military has three pillars of its gun culture. And those are training, safety, and accountability. Um, and, and if you ask any veteran, you'll probably get them to sort of nod, yes, like those, those are the three pillars. And, and that's what my drill sergeant, you know, drilled into my head. Uh, but a lot of times when we look at civilian culture, civilian gun culture, we don't see uh, training, safety, and accountability in our culture or laws. Um, and, and we kind of see that the military uses that really effectively to preserve the force and, and to utilize those weapons um, you know, that profession of arms. Um, and so, uh, so when we look at the civilian world and we don't see that, it, it causes alarm for a lot of veterans and it causes them, even if they're gun owners, even if they're, you know, even pro-gun rights folks, it causes a little bit of alarm to look at the state of our country right now uh, and, and where our gun laws are and, and maybe that they should look a little bit more like the military. What is the state of our um, gun rights laws right now? How would you characterize the state of our gun rights laws? Uh, chaos, corruption. Um, you know, we, we live in a country where 95% of Americans support a, a law that would require, a federal law that would require a background check on all gun sales, right? So basically, 
Um, what, what we would need to do to get there is to close loopholes that currently exist about guns that are sold at gun shows um, and guns that are show, show, sold over the internet, uh, which, is, which is, you know, way more prevalent now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Um, we need to close those loopholes and 95% of Americans agree. Let's, let's do that. Let's just make sure everyone buys a gun and gets, can pass a background check. That's, that's easy. It's really easy. Every federally fi licensed firearm dealer does that today. Uh, we have 50 senators in the U.S. Senate who won't vote to advance that bill, who won't make that bill a reality, defying 95% of Americans and their, and their preferences. So there's not a, a Republican senator out there who doesn't have the majority of their constituency that thinks we should have background checks, yet they won't vote for it. So I see that as a fundamental failure of representative democracy. These, these, these senators who are, who are opposing background checks at the federal level on every gun sale, they are, uh, they, they, they are sort of flouting the idea that they represent their constituents um, and they are, um, they're, they're, they're voting on behalf of you know, the donors and the gun lobby and, and, and what they think that the culture is. And by the way, that 95% is, is also 85% of gun owners and 75% of NRA members. So three quarters of NRA members are like, yeah, people should have to pass background checks and those are responsible gun owners, but we are, we're letting these gun laws kind of go wild and then getting guns into the hands of people, dangerous people who shouldn't have them and that's causing death. It's, just, it's strange, it's an irrational disconnect. You know, when I was a kid, I had a 22 rifle that a lot of kids in my, my world had them. And we belonged to the NRA. And the NRA was all about safety and training. And uh, it's extraordinary how the NRA has changed. Do you understand the, you know, what do you want to call it, the, um, the environment of the NRA that it would oppose any kind of gun control or steps to avoid violence with guns? Uh, it, it's hard to understand it. Um, it, it's hard to understand it if you're a rational person who, you know, doesn't enjoy seeing people die uh, from gun violence. But if you can compartmentalize your motivations to profit, uh, the profit of the gun industry, um, then you realize that, you know, especially because guns are durable goods, right? Like they last a long time. So you own one gun, you don't need to own two or three or four or five. You're not replacing them like toilet paper. You know, you got to you, you, you can own it for a lifetime. Uh, you can pass guns down. And, um, and so to sell more guns, we have to create more urgency and more demands. And, um, you know, the NRA and the gun lobby has done a great job of, of saying, convincing Americans that they need to buy more guns. Um, and they'll, they'll use, ironically, of course, they use the mass shootings, like right? the, 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 the news making gun violence and gun death events uh, to promote and uh, the, you know, the, the sale of, of, of guns by saying like, hey, if you don't buy these guns now, they're going to be banned and you're not going to be able to get them. So run out and buy your AR-15s right, right now. And so you've, you, you've seen them take, you know, all for the purposes of profit, you've seen them take a, any gun anywhere for anyone at any time, no questions asked stance. That is their, that is their policy. And so when you, when you look at any potential gun safety law that is proposed, they're going to compare that safety law to that agenda and see how it compares. And that's how they'll draw their position. And it's always to oppose anything that has to do with, with safety or, or any type of restriction or any type of common sense measure that would you know, keep our children safe, keep our communities safe, et cetera, et cetera. Extraordinary. And, and uh, half of the Senate, for example, will never vote for prevention of gun violence. You know, um, the, the politics is interesting, too. There must be a political narrative that those lobbyists are also selling. Maybe like um, they're coming for, the Russians are coming. I don't know if Russia is a good example, but um, they're coming for us. Uh, they're, they're coming into your community. They're threatening you, your lives, and you have to be ready to defend yourself. Is that part of the lobbying narrative? It certainly is. I don't know if if the threat is ever the Russians or any foreign threat, honestly, I mean, there's, we have the strongest military in the world and, and the National Guard and Reserves to back them up. And I, I think that most people think that that is uh, relatively sufficient. I'd, 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 I'd love to get into a debate that, that says that our military is not sufficient to at least protect our domestic interests. Um, 
Uh, th so the enemy they created couldn't really be Russia or China or Iran or anything like that or North Korea. You know, the, the, the enemy they created was internal, right? They said that your enemy is uh, Antifa. Your enemy is, um, you know, government goons who are going to come knock down your door and take your guns from you. Um, you know, the enemy is, you know, the sitting president if, if he or she happens to be a Democrat, right? That's, that's, what, they, that's what they said and um, that's what they continue to say. And so this idea that um, we have to have guns to protect ourselves against ourselves is, seems quite anti-American. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's couched in this narrative about the, 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 in the way, in the way the second amendment was created. Um, and, and, and we think about Minutemen and we think about, um, you know, the revolutionary war and we think about the second amendment, but of course, the second amendment wasn't written until a decade after the revolutionary war was complete, right? That, that we need to remember that, that the bill of rights wasn't written until the constitution was ratified and, um, and it was written by slave owners, right? It was written by James Madison, right? It was written by Thomas Jefferson. Like these people, they 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 own they owned humans in bondage, um, and and it's clear even today that the the gun rights narrative that has percolated through our culture for more than two centuries is actually moored in racism and slavery and and those things. Like those those gun rights were given um, so that we could control slave rebellions, we being the United States or slave owners. Slave owners could control um, slave rebellions and, and capture runaway slaves. Um, and you see shifts in, uh, in the middle part of the 19th century in the way that gun laws were written to try to keep guns out of the hands of the freed slaves after the Civil War. Um, and of course you see the way that, that, that black people were treated with gun rights in the Jim Crow era. Um, you even see in the 1970s as the Black Panthers started to become a, a prominent armed group of, of, of Black people that the state of California started instituting much stricter gun control laws um, at, at the, in that era. Um, and even today, there was a recent study that said that, that the, um, you can look at a county today and, and the proportion or the, the rates of gun ownership are correlated to the rates of slave ownership in 1850. Wow. Still today, a county that had more slaves then has more guns now. So I think that, you know, it's, it's really tied um, the, the, the long-term cultural narrative is, is, is inherently tied to race, which becomes imminently more complicated in Hawaii, right? Because it, 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 it's not the same. And we weren't part of the United States in the, the middle of the 19th century. So it, 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 it begs a lot of questions about sort of the, the local aspects of that. But nationwide, it is, it is inherently tied to race. So if you could talk to your distant relative who fought in the Revolutionary War, um, what do you think he would say to you? Do you talk to him? What do you think he would say to you? <laughs> uh, his name was William Marvin. Uh, so, so he's in my paternal line. My, my nephew is also William Marvin. And that, that's the William Marvin I talked to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he was a private. I, I don't know that he was doing much more than farming in you know Onondaga County near Syracuse when he joined that revolution. But 1776 in in New York State, if he was in, if he was downstate in New York City, was was pretty insane um, with with the British and the naval assets that they had, and they, they took New York and held New York for the Revolution. I think that he would have been um, proud and scared, um, and you know, it, New York didn't have Minutemen like the like the New England states did, or New England uh, excuse me, New England colonies did. Um, that was more uh, of more of a regular army, and it was George Washington's army at the time. And so, um, you know, he owned a gun, most likely. He, he may have owned a gun um, prior to being in the military. Um, it would have been, you know, a <laughs> nothing compared to the weapons we see today, right? And you give it, we always need to remember that the second well, for for constitutional originalists, we need to remember that the Second Amendment was written when we had muskets, right? <laughs> right. If you want to be an originalist, that's really the only gun that it should protect. The second amendment is the right to bear muskets and then the rest of it needs to be decided in legislation um, moving forward. We haven't done a great job of that. Um, we've kind of grandfathered everything in. Uh, a gun is a gun is a gun, including ghost guns, which we can talk about later. But, um, you know, I think I think that my uh, my sixth great grandfather would have understood the utility of the, the weapon that he owned um, for the purposes that he owned it, whether it was, personal or military, and he probably used it for hunting. 
Um, and then he used it to defend himself and his family against, you know, what he thought was a foreign invader, I suppose, at the time and sort of the British. And um, and I did the same thing, right? Like I served, as did my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, we all bit four arms for this country. Um, and we did it in, in combat, we did it on foreign soil. Um, and, and that was a, an, an intentional purpose and, and a good use of those weapons um, to the to the limits of, of war being good, right? But it was a, a legitimate use of those weapons. And uh, and it's just vastly different from the oh, environment we're looking at today. It's gone, gone mad. So, um, you know, Marvin Strategies, you organized Marvin Strategies. It's an important organization in your life and work. Um, why did you organize it and what does it do? And what is it doing, you know, to affect uh, control of gun violence? Uh, you know, Mar Marvin Strategies has done a, a lot of different things. We've been around for about seven years now. Um, I sort of hung my own shingle after running a, a large national nonprofit that was working on the way veterans were portrayed on film and television. So working a lot with the entertainment industry. And I, I saw opportunity to do things on my own that I wasn't able to do uh, is, but because of the constraints of a nonprofit. Um, and uh, I've what sort of what the, the the firm is doing now is is really narrowed down to to sort of a, a couple things. One, there's still some work in film, um, and I'm actually just uh, have a couple of clients right now that are that are that are film related. Um, but the bigger clients are usually large nonprofits, um, and I'm working on how they are able to engage veterans and veteran voices in the issues that they're dealing with, their mission and their advocacy. Um, and I work primarily in gun violence prevention. I work for every town for gun safety as a consultant, and um, that's the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country. I also work on uh, something that's not quite related, but national parks advocacy. I work for the National Parks Conservation Association, doing the same thing, bringing veteran voices to their work. And in both instances, um, I really, you know, I see and the organizations see how those veteran voices are uh, effective in, in delivering their message and their advocacy. I like to tell people often that I'm working what I consider working on what I consider to be the the best thing about America and the worst thing about America, right? So national parks being the best and gun violence prevent gun violence being the worst, um, and so I get to sort of work at either end of my, my passion spectrum. Um, what so can you do? What do you do to change the way Congress is thinking? And you know the, the, that those fifty Republican uh, senators, for example. Are you going down there? Are you encouraging other people to go down there? Are you writing letters? Are you are you uh, hitting the you know the media with this issue? Uh, so, what I am doing is 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 adding veteran voices to that conversation, right? And so we see veteran voices as uh, well veterans as very as, as respected by most Americans for their service, um, and then really credible um, and trusted for their opinions on guns because we come from that profession of arms, and so. Whether it's a veteran writing an op-ed, a veteran testifying before Congress, meeting behind the scenes with congress congressional members or staff, um, you know, grassroots organizing too. We're trying to, you know, every town for gun safety has the largest. Um, it's not only the largest gun violence prevention organization, but it has the largest grassroots effort in Moms Demand Action. Right, it's the same organization. Moms Demand Action is the grassroots arm, and so I'm helping to teach the leaders at the Moms Demand Action level how to engage veterans on their own. Um, so it's not just, you know, there's there's a, a veteran advisory council we have at the national level, 32 veterans who are uh, a, a, a wealth of diverse experience um, and backgrounds. Uh, and so we'll use them for the sort of more high level, federal, national level things, but uh, also expanding it to the grassroots. So in field work so that they can have veterans uh, speaking up on all of this. And we, we see it over and over that veterans tend to be a politically moderating voice. Right, that, that when we have these contentious issues, I mean, there's nothing more divisive right now in this country. Well, there's things that are as divisive, but tied with things like abortion, gun rights are, are pretty divisive along party lines. And, um, and, and so when a veteran comes in to talk about it with that respect, with that credibility, you might get both sides of the aisle to, to take a decent listen to what he or she has to say. And that's, that's what we're trying to leverage in whatever way we can. You know, our, our moderator for the program on September 30, Avi Stoifer, the former dean of the law school and constitutional uh, lawyer, um, is, you know, he may very well ask you this question. So I would like to ask you this question, too. 
we're, we're covering um, you know, gun violence prevention through you. We're covering abortion in America. We're covering the challenges of climate change. We're covering um, uh, voting rights in America beyond uh, insurrection. Let's uh, take a moment and put the flyer on the screen. There you are. I see you. There you are. Uh, <laughs> so um, if you were to take a stab at what the common denominator is for all these issues, I mean, you mentioned, you know, that the, there's a political divisiveness, at least for a few of them, maybe all of them. Um, yeah, it certainly seems like all of them, doesn't it? Uh, what, what, you know, how do you see the common denominator for dealing with all these five prominent issues? I do. I mean, I think you you answered the question in the question, which is it's it's, it's political divisiveness, it's hyperpartisanship, it's um, tribalism. Um, it, you know, it is it is thinking that that you know I'm right and you're wrong. Um, even with this part work I do on national parks, right? A lot of the work we do on national parks can be nonpartisan. Um, we want to designate, you know, um, a specific area. Uh, and, you know, I think we're working on, uh, there's a designation coming up in Colorado on an old military base with a 10th mountain train that we think will go through and, and everybody looks at it and they're like, yeah, that's a great idea. We should make that a, uh, a national monument. Um, but, but a lot of what we're dealing with in parks is climate change, right? And if you look at the floods in Yellowstone and the fires in Yosemite and, you know, the, the drought in California and all of that is, is, is climate change. Um, um, and so, you get to these points where to really solve a problem, it, it does become hyper political. And so um, it, it's it's interesting to work in, in the gun violence prevention world um, and try to navigate that. I, I recently had a conversation with um, someone in, in Hollywood who's interested in, in a, a addressing these issues on film and really wanting to address it from a, from a bipartisan lens, or from a, a sort of multi-ideological lens. And one of the things I said is, well, you know, how do you do that? Um, because if, if it really feels like it, in the gun violence prevention world, it is the extreme gun right angle versus the middle of the road common sense. Like, like the, the, the left has come to a point where on guns, they're in the middle. Like there's nobody saying repeal the second amendment. There's nobody saying take guns away. There's nobody, I mean, there, there's few and far between, but like the, the, the federal legislators are not saying that. They're just saying like, can we have the background checks that 95% of Americans want? Can we do that? I, I don't think there's a more middle of the road approach to politics than let's do what the, the vast majority of Americans want us to do. And so, when I was talking to these folks, it's like, how do you how are you going to get both sides if one side has had to shift to, shift all the way to the middle just to have the debate? Let me offer a thought. See what you think about it. You know, um, there there may be this is the, if you get into the the right wing side of the divisiveness, um, call it the Trump side or the Republican side, the you know the the right wing extremist side of it. Uh, you may not feel all that strongly about gun violence prevention. You may be moderate about gun violence prevention. But when you get into that bubble, you, you wind up, you know, taking um, the right wing side of all the issues. So I may, I may have strong feelings for religious reasons, for example, about abortion. And that takes me into the bubble. Now I say, well, if I'm in the bubble... Um, I should oppose uh, gun violence prevention. I should uh, provoke, pro you know, I should oppose anything about climate change. I may like voting rights, but um, I, you know, I believe that the government ought to turn over and we ought to have an insurrection. What I'm saying is that if you get in for one reason, it seems like you have to join up for all the reasons. Is this the way things work? Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think for, for the last, I mean, I suppose most of my lifetime, um, you know, last 20 or 30 years, um, the 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 political right seems to be a confederation of single issue voters, right? It's just like you know, hey, I'm here for abortion, um, I'm anti-abortion, and therefore I'm going to vote the party platform, and and it becomes deeply ironic. I mean, I this I, I I was raised Catholic. I went to 16 years of Catholic school. I'm I'm a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, um, and and was was very much raised pro-life. Where does gun violence prevention fall on the pro-life spectrum? Right. Like it's it's pretty clear that if you are a pro-lifer, 
you need to be against gun violence. Like you have to be. And if you're Catholic, the Pope is very clear about that as well. And I'm just, you know, I'm just pulling out Catholics, not all, all Christians, but um, same with the death penalty, right? We have this, this sort of this, the, the, how, can, how can the right be pro-life and for the death penalty, right? Like it just doesn't make sense. So, so there's a lot of hypocrisy um, and it has to do, of course, with the two-party system. And, you know, I'm not a political science expert, but I mean, I do know that when I look at the 95% of Americans that support background checks, that's the, when you ask them about that issue, that's what they support. But, you know, the, 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 from, from 50 to 95, the, those folks, they're still going to vote Republican and gonna, they're going to have, you know, you vote for someone who's not going to support background checks. So it doesn't, it doesn't make the mark to change their vote, even though that's what they support, which is fine. And, 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 and that's fine if and only if your representatives aren't, you know, voting or aren't, aren't voting in blocks, right? If that, if that representative can look and say, well, then my personal position is that we shouldn't have background checks for whatever reason, but I recognize that 75% of my constituency wants that and they voted for me. Um, and maybe they voted for me because of my position on abortion, but I know what they want on guns, so I'll vote for the background check thing. And that's where you get sort of moderate compromise. You represent a democracy. It's, it is what the framers wanted, um, but, but you know, we, don't, we don't see it um, today. And, and, and so we have to find other ways, right? Like we're really only thinking about legislation right now, um, but there, you know, there's, there's also litigation is, is a huge part of the gun violence prevention movement. And you've seen some success in what folks have done with, with Sandy Hook and, 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 the, and the gun manufacturers and their advertising. Um, there's also, you know, the market forces and what, what big business can do um, from Walmart to MasterCard um, and, and, and on and on. And, uh, and then, of course, there's just culture, right? There, we have a gun culture in this country. What, what do we want that to say? Um, and we touched a little bit about that. But there's a lot of ways to sort of intervene and figure out how to reduce gun violence. It's not, not just legislation. So, and yet, and yet, with the technology of uh, ghost guns that you mentioned earlier, um, and with these extraordinary massacres, just to the um, casual observer, it seems to be getting worse. Am I right? It's absolutely getting worse, right? So the gun violence rates are significantly up, gun deaths are up. Um, the pandemic certainly inflamed that. You know, for a while it went down, it kind of went like down. And then when it came back, it went way back up, you know, so lockdown prevented some gun violence, um, although. Uh, maybe increased sort of domestic instances. Um, and also it, it left the, the lockdowns and, and sort of just the being at home during COVID left a lot of people at home with maybe, you know, not properly secured firearms, right? So a lot of in increasing in suicides and increasing in accidental shootings. Um, you know, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot to think about with the mass shootings because they, they're what makes the headlines, right? And there, you know, you see the assault rifles that put the mass in mass shooting, um, and, and a lot of a lot of sentiment against, you know, the availability of assault rifles and and the ability to have them on on civilian streets. Um, it's a real small portion proportion of of gun deaths uh, come from mass shootings and school shootings and and those things. And and there's also way more mass shootings than we think they are. Right? We only hear about the ones that you got to get into the teens these days with the death count to, before you can really make the news. You know, there's going to be mass shootings um, on a near daily basis uh, that, that have, you know, four, four deaths, right? And we just, if it doesn't happen in our home, in our, near our home, we're not going to hear about it. We're not going to hear about that mass shooting in Tulsa tomorrow, where, where only four people die. But that's incredible, because a couple decades ago, that would be, you know, the lead story on, on the nightly news nationally. Um, but you see, we see some action happening after the recent mass shootings in Uvalde and Buffalo um, and, and a few others this summer. And you saw the first bipartisan legislation on gun safety passed um, out of Congress in, um, I want to say it was 20, more than 25 years. Um, and so- Was that, that was enough? Probably, oh, no, it was definitely not enough. And I think, you know, I think that there were, there were we had higher, so we didn't get background checks out of it. I mean, that's that the one I've been talking about for the whole time. So that that would have been a big step, but we got some things. It was it was the kind of laws that, that that at least brought some of the states up to par with. I mean, I looked at it, and there's not much that was going to affect Hawaii because the things that were created by federal law had already been legislated at the state level. In in Hawaii and other states, 
uh, that have good gun laws. New York, California, Illinois, et cetera, et cetera. Like they, they, there was not a lot that that federal law did, but it was a good sign. The other thing that's happened is um, we have an ATF director and uh, alcohol, all, alcohol, tobacco, uh, and firearms. We have the, um, a director for the first time in, uh, well, I want to say it's been more than, I don't even know, it's been definitely more than five years. It's been a long time. We've had just had interim directors. Um, so we finally got one confirmed. And um, one of the things the ATF did actually, I believe it was before he was confirmed, um, was they did make ghost guns illegal, right? So, so there's and there's no reason to have ghost guns. There's just there's just no reason. You're literally letting, um, you know, people build their own guns. Uh, and so we were able to, the ATF was able to change the definition of a firearm effectively. That's the simple way to put it. They changed the definition of a firearm so that an 80% complete firearm was deemed a firearm, and previously it wasn't. And they were shipping out 85, 80% complete firearms with a drill bit and a and a and a um, and a template to to drill a couple holes and then now you have a functioning gun and so it's like that that was the easiest way for a dangerous person to to get guns just with a couple hundred bucks and so we we have made progress there as well um it all takes me to to the last question i want to ask you and that is uh, so this is about legal chicken legal egg and uh, when i think of that i think first of uh, of the dobbs case and uh, you know abortion and roe v wade and all that and so the Supreme Court takes it, you know, they repeal Roe v. Wade and they and they leave it to the states. And then you have and then you have chaos, um, 50 states, uh, you know, and hundreds of rules and uh, hard to hard to find um, real stability there. It's hard to find uh, a path. And uh, you go, which which state do you go to? Which which country do you go to? Um, and I and I suspect that the, the same kind of. Um, you know, phenomenon exists for other issues that we're going to cover. And I, and I wonder whether it, um, you know, it also applies in gun safety, uh, gun, gun violence prevention, in the sense that, you know, uh, shouldn't this all be federal? Uh, why, why are we leaving it to this kind of perverse federalism where every state has its own rules? Um, isn't the federal government the one that should be opining on this? Or shouldn't we have this legislation Stronger, stronger legislation, um, rather than leaving it to the states. Because if you if you take action one way or the other, and then you leave it to the states, then then you get a, a kind of you get chaos. Uh, and and I wonder what your thoughts are about legal chicken, legal egg, uh, with the notion that you know you, you do something at one level, and then um, there's a reaction, and the reaction may not be what you want, and then you have to do something else to clean that up. And before you know it, you're in this, this spiral where nothing is getting done. Yeah. Guns are very interesting when it comes to that. It's there's a little yes and a little no to your question. I, I um, and I actually I actually have a friend, uh, a veteran who works with me on gun violence prevention. He's a libertarian, and he thinks that the federal government should do nothing except gun violence prevention. He does think that there should be gun laws at the federal level. So so yes, there's there's that sentiment, and a lot of the um, a lot of the the that you'll see folks trying to prevent that sort of federal oversight when it comes to the gun safety laws. So again, background checks, red flag laws that are that are saving lives and preventing suicides, like all of these things that are instituted at state levels and proven to work are not happening at the federal level because people are saying, well, well that should be a, a state thing. And then the exact same week, I think it was like two days apart or one day apart from the Dobbs decision was the Bruin decision, which was out of New York, same Supreme Court, same justices, same, more or less same division of the justices saying that. Uh, That's the one that struck the Sullivan law. States don't have the, 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 the right to figure out who should have a concealed carry permit. Right. Yeah, talk so, about so, chaos, huh? Yeah, so, so, so while you're saying, let's throw it to the states for abortion, but uh, gosh, states could not ever handle concealed carry permits. That would be crazy. Um, and so what, what's happening in Hawaii is we're currently, the counties are restructuring the way that they issue um, permits for, for firearms. Um, and uh, Honolulu County is in the process of doing it now. Maui and Hawaii counties have already done it. Um, and it's moving from what we call a, a May issue state where it may issue a permit state and it's sort of up to the sheriff's discretion and you need to provide uh, a proper cause that proper cause for the permit has now been uh deemed unconstitutional and uh, it doesn't mean there's a constitutional right to conceal carry a firearm but it means that the, that the standard that the state set was unconstitutional um 
And we're, we're certainly concerned about the way that Honolulu is going to change their sort of the sheriff's discretion. Um, but what it's going to do is we're going to have more people in our state carrying guns around. And that's that's ultimately what's going to do. And so, like, what else do we need to do now? Because we actually don't have laws in this state um, that will help us, you know, figure out where people can and can't carry a gun. I talked to my kids school the other day and I said, do we have a firearm policy? They said, no. I said, let's get one really quickly because you have hundreds of people in line in Honolulu County to get uh, concealed carry permits. And we need to make sure that if that's a parent at our school, that they know that they can't drive onto our school property with that gun. Right. We have the right to do that as a, as, as a school. Um, but we didn't have that policy in place. And so I think it's just examples of the ways we're going to have, that's the chicken and egg, right? We're going to have to catch up. We're going to have to make new county and state level laws and legislation and policies to, to, to back up this fact that the federal government, the Supreme Court, the nine people or less than nine people, but six, five or six people decided that we are not responsible enough as a state and a state governing a, you know, um, entity to, you know, to determine what's best for our citizens when it comes to firearms. Um, that's, and it's, it's, it's deeply ironic and deeply hypocritical of the Supreme Court to put those decisions in the same week on a fundamentally different legal arguments, but such is America in the 21st century. Mm, yeah, such is America. Well, I think after this show, I have to go soak my head. I often have to go soak my head. Chris, is there any message you want to leave with our viewership about, you know, this issue in general or the program on September 30th? I, I hope that folks join join the program and watch, and we'll have a, a, a much more um, in depth and spirited conversation. I assume on on all those other four issues, which I'm excited to hear about and maybe find some of those connections. But I think when it comes to to gun violence prevention, I think that the people in Hawaii need to um, they need to wake up a little bit. Um, the one thing I would say is that we actually have a very very vocal minority of pro gun people, gun rights folks. That are actually getting to our representatives. They're sort of getting to our um, uh, our lawmakers, and they're 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 influencing policy in an undue way. So sort of that the five percent overweighing the ninety five percent. And so I think we need more people, especially with the laws I was just describing, to stand up and say we want to save Hawaii. Um, we want to have you know certain laws in place in this next legislative session, and we need we need people to speak up for it. Um, it's much easier to speak up when you're like I'm pro gun. I love guns. I want to talk about it because being anti-gun violence is sort of a natural state, right? So like, but we need to have vocal voices, vocal voices, we need to have loud voices uh, on gun violence prevention. And, and I hope that many, many people who hear this and join us next week will stand up and do that. Chris Marvin, Marvin Strategies, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Look forward to seeing the program next week. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.